What if the key measurement is different between the performer and the stakeholder? So the stakeholder wants it cheap. The performer wants it done well, so they're not having to do rework. Yeah, so the um, that's a client decision. So that's, again, another reason, uh, a function of the project steering team in the gate review meetings. If my stakeholders have picked master performers and other subject matter experts, then I'm going to bring back what those people said. And if they don't like it, that's their decision. They can go, well, you know, we can't do that. That's that's going striving for perfection, you know, which is the enemy of good. So we can, you know, they got, they've got to decide, you know, we training people, we learning people can't, you know, fix that for them. They've got to decide what do they want? How do they direct their people to do this? And we can train people up to that level. And we can say, guy, don't, don't do rework on that or don't spend more than 10 minutes per unit on that or whatever. Don't spend more than a week on that, you know, because we're trying to control our costs because, you know, if you look at the quality measures of quality, quantity, and cost, those are the basic kind of standard measures. And all of you should figure out how are things measured in your enterprise, you know, from the quality people or the business process people or whomever, but how, what is the language that they use and adapt that as best you can. And if they're missing something, then you can bring something new to the table for them. But, but that's a business decision as to what we do. And then they can tell me, and then I can, you know, construct a learning experience to kind of help people get there, but not overachieve in certain areas. Because if you talk to master performers, they usually have big egos. They don't want to be known for making any mistakes. They're going to go the whole nine yards and do it to perfection as best they can. Now, if that makes them successful, you got to ask the client and stakeholders, don't you want more of that? You know, or what are the limits and constraints we can put on these things? Because we don't want to spend a hundred dollars on something that we're spent, you know, selling for 90. So, you know, we don't want to do that. So that's the balancing act of master performers and what the stakeholder requirements are. The customer may want perfection. The management may say, we can't afford to produce perfection and our competitors are at 50%. We don't need to be at 100%. All we got to do is beat 50%. Now, master performers may grumble with that, <laughs> about that. But but again, it's a business decision. That's The client's got to decide that. And that's why when you create the project steering team or whatever it needs to be called, you can work with them. And again, if there's more than one person there, one person might make a think it's really smart, but come up with a really stupid idea. And if you don't have the balance of their peers or the other stakeholders to, to play that off on, then you might, you might be pushed in the wrong direction. Now, you know, and I would say, yeah, Hey, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't do it that way, but let me salute you here. Get out of my way. I'm going to go do that right now for you. And they go, what do you mean? You're not going to. So it, it, it always depends on the amount of trust and relationship that you have with your clients and the other stakeholders. If they can see that you are not resisting things for, you know, because you're lazy or whatever, whatever they attribute that to, you're trying to do good work for the people, the performers, the customers that live with the stuff that the people produce, the regulatory agencies, the, the shareholders that want, you know, want to make a buck, and management who is has their own worries you're trying to balance all of those stakeholders in helping the organization meet the requirements and the constraints of those stakeholders and it's it's not necessarily easy but i think it is our job otherwise we're just cranking out content like that's a good thing and i'm sorry the world's got more than enough content <laughs> and 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 learners i don't think want more content <laughs> They want good stuff as as short as possible, but as long as necessary to help them learn to be proficient, learn to be competent. Thank you so much. Guy, we have a question from Teresa. Thank you, Guy. Teresa? Yes. Shoot. Hi. Okay. So my question is, have you used this process with a government agency and if so, are there notable differences between the government and business in the EDI process? And the reason I ask that is because I have heard of a newly created within the last two years training unit um, 
in the Oregon Department of Human Services. And we are at that pivotal point where we can be the order takers or we can look at the problems, analyze them and determine what that solution is going to be. And so within this process, did you have to make any changes when working with a government agency? Yeah, because the government language is long, uh, is different in some cases. So you can't think of the government as one big amorphous kind of, they're all the same. They're all different, just like every company, just like the left-hand side of the building is from the right-hand side of the building in the same company. There's all these differences, variances. So I've done this with NASA. After the Challenger accident, everybody in my analysis team and design team were crying because they knew the astronauts that died. I've done this with the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. I've done this with a couple of other government agencies, and they're all different. So it's that early negotiation of, you know, I would take the order and make sure my order fulfillment process ensures that I do an adequate analysis effort, a quick analysis effort, not something that takes forever and a day. Um, I need to know what data I need and go get it quickly. And I need to have the customer, the client, the stakeholders point me to the right sources and go get that. And if they want to call outputs deliverables, sure, we can do that. I mean, so this it's negotiation of the language of the customer. You always want to be speaking in the language of the customer. And that, and if you're coming in and you, but if you're inside an organization, it just takes a little while to figure that out. Here's what, you know, guy or somebody else's model, here's his language. What do they call it? Okay, let's make those edits really quickly here and talk in their language here because that just makes it easier for them to understand us when we're not introducing new language. So I think that, you know, if you're at a point where you're kind of new and you're going to create your own order fulfillment process so you can take the order and get to that pivot point and help your clients make the decision. Because I, I gave up a $900,000 project back in the 90s when the client said, they reviewed the analysis data and said, oh, guy, uh, they were whispering among each other. And I knew what was going on because the data said, training ain't going to solve this. And they said, could you go down to the cafeteria and grab a cup of coffee for a while? We need to have a discussion. And I said, sure. And I think what you need. So I just blurted it out. You don't need training. And they said, and then they brought me back in. And they said, yeah, we want you to do the training project, but we want to put you on hold because we're expanding this operation and we're gonna triple the size of it, which means a whole bunch of new people that don't know what they're doing. So we need to go fix the process and fix some of these other things that you helped us see. And then we need to, the training for the for the new people coming in and we're in a hurry. So, and I thought, yeah, okay, they're never gonna call me back, but they did. And, and the project continued and finished, but it was a huge high stakes stuff. Um, when you're, you don't, push these things you don't make a stand for low stake stuff because people just sometimes they got to check the box and get it in there you know that's all part of the real world but if you you can help them see for high stakes process performance high risk high reward that's what a high stakes is um you know what could what's the worst that could happen well we could blow the building up and kill everybody well okay that sounds like high stakes okay so how do we how do we make sure that we do a really good job with this because of the consequences that exist if guy doesn't know what he's doing and he can kill people or he can destroy the product we'll ship it the customer will be really angry have to ship it back we'll have to do the you know those are the kinds of things that that and when we talk in terms of outputs and tasks and the environmental factors, uh, instead of talking learning lingo, clients like that because they think, oh, you, you're, you know, but if we talk learning jargon to them, they don't have time for that. They don't, they don't think we're serious about trying to understand them and help them. So one of the secrets is always learn the language of the customer. And I would go in as a, as a consultant and say, hey, I call it this thing this. What do you guys call it? Okay, let's, well, I'll change. And I say, sorry if I slip because I've been doing this a long time using my language, but I'm going to try to make sure I use your language and show that I'm really on their side working with them. We're not at odds. I'm trying to help them. They want to make decisions that I don't agree with. I salute and go do what they wanted. And if we have to go back to rework and work that stuff, they may come around and say, hey, guy, what was your idea again? Maybe we should try that. Sure. And do it without, you know, 
told you so, you know, because you you're on their side. And that's what we do as a support organization in our in our companies. Um Teresa, does that answer your question? Yes, and it's funny that you highlighted some barriers that we've already come across. They're age old. They were they were there before 1979 when I entered the field because I heard the thought leaders whining and moaning about these very same things that now that I'm an old guy, I'll moan about the same things too. But now I, it, was, it was, took me about 10 years in the profession to understand they were right. They're complaining about this stuff. This goes back to the 60s when we started formalizing all of this. Dan? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. First of all, thank you for uh, presenting today. Um, such great information that you've shared. Um, really excited to, to hear it. So having said that, you know, for someone like me who is very limited in, in my experience, you know, in that environment. So what would you suggest in terms of, you know, maybe some of your content that you've put together would be like a good next step for us to kind of go and look at to, uh, to, to get us better acquainted with um, with, with, with this world and, and, and the information that you just shared with us? So I had, uh, back in 2011, I created uh, 55 different videos on how to do my methods, from project planning to analysis to design to development to pilot test, blah, blah, blah. And it parallels my Lean ISD book. So I've got this Lean ISD book, 410 pages. The clients all said, how can you call this book Lean when it's 410 pages, guy? I go, it'll hold a door open in a windstorm. Um, but so that book is, it, it, you can get it for free, a free PDF, and you can follow that and look at the videos. And there's a place on my website where I say, here's how the chapters align to the videos. And so you can decide, I don't need to look at any of the project management stuff. I want to be an analyst or I want to be a designer and look at guys' methods there and adapt from there, right? Don't necessarily adopt, adapt. So I've got my five roles uh, that I had when I had staff, because I in my first two consulting firms, I had uh, 15 to 25 staff members. But so my, my roles are project planner and manager. You plan it, you manage it. Sorry, poor plan, you live with it as the project manager. Then there was the analyst. Then there was the curriculum architecture designer, which is different than the uh, modular curriculum designer, which is the ADDIE level, the course development stuff, versus the architecture, the learning path, the whole thing end to end. You know, so those were my, two of my methodologies were at the architecture level and then at the development level. And then I had um, lead developer. So what I did with my staff is I brought people in to be developers. I made them the lead developer. Then I had them be the designer because they'd been working with other people's designs. So they knew what design was. They had to learn how to do that. Then I made them analysts. And then I made them project planners and managers. Um, that was just how I progressed people through the pipeline to build my the capacity of my staff. But I didn't need everybody to be a project planner and manager. And not everybody was good at it. My experience says my best analysts were lousy designers. No kidding. Hate to tell you that, but, you know, and my best is, and vice versa. So, you know, it's, it's, you can't, but I did find people that could do it all and learned it like that. You know, it just came natural to them for whatever reason. And, but people are different. And so I needed to find people where they felt most comfortable and competent and maybe after a year or two doing something, they would want to branch out because they'd seen enough of it. They figured they demystified it. It now somehow worked in their heads. But I think that so that's that's the place you got to start. Where so I began as a program developer. I wrote stuff. I wrote scripts. I wrote the ancillary materials that went with our video based uh, training. And then I got into doing <clears throat> the design of it. And then I got into doing the analysis. And so I'll tell you one thing that my the person that taught me how to do analysis going out and doing interviews, she said, Guy, you ask a question, you get their answer, and then you jump right into your next question. Shut up. Take some notes. Just doodle something. Because 
when when you give the silence, the person that you're interviewing well, is going to feel a need to give you more. And that's where the good stuff is. So I learned that. So part of this is that, you know, some people come in with these skills already from their education and experience. And so uh, what works for one person may not work for the next. And the role that they're assigned to may be different. So if you're going to be a designer and a developer and not an analyst, not a project planner, then you can focus. And so uh, I will send to Rhea the, the uh, URL for that page on one of my several websites where you can say, here's where I can get the book. Here's these videos. And so I can go and look at all that stuff here and, and uh, you know, begin to internalize that and start playing with it. And again, always adapt to the language of your business because most likely they've got it. And my experience says, suggests that my clients and big corporations, most of the people in the, in the training and development organization, the learning and development organization didn't have a clue as to what the language of their business was. That's one huge thing that can help you immensely by figuring that out. And then figuring out how score is kept. You know, how do we measure things around here? You know, <laughs> how do we generate profits? You know, what is our cost structure? What do we call these things? What's our budgeting cycle? Um, do we have a quality organization? Go make friends with them. Uh, you want to measure the impact of your performance. They already know how to measure the impact of their improvements to processes. They got what you need. Don't be going and inventing new learning metrics and stuff like that when the quality organization has already got them in place. Especially the government's got all that kind of stuff too. Most organizations do. And they're sometimes they're an island to themselves and they're not having total widespread impact. They got the same complaints that we in learning and development have had since I've been in the business. Back to um, the exercise. Did anybody have any questions about, can you figure out what the output is? You're doing stuff. You produce an output. What I was told is, hey, guy, it was the stuff that's left on your desk when you go home at night. That's your output. It's either done or you're still working on it. You know, that's the kind of thing we need to have, that output focus uh, that people are on the payroll to produce things, not to just do things. That's a means to the ends of producing something. And whatever you produce has to have utility downstream. You hand that off to somebody else. They're the ones who are using your output as their input. Do we understand that? Look for those interfaces of the handoffs. Uh, Guy, um, given that some of us are very new to this line of thinking, could you talk to us about how to perhaps mitigate some of the rookie mistakes? Or if th this is not done within one's department or organization, how do we bring that practice in? Any thoughts around that? Well, I think that, you know, so analysis paralysis is the big thing. It's such a big thing that over in England and Europe, they call it discovery because if you use the word analysis, everybody, you know, that shuns you. And and so the when I remember when I first started in 79 and 80, seeing people's examples of their analysis output, task analysis, a bunch of random tasks. Looks like they shook them up and then laid them all out. And, you know, you go, what? And if you show that to a client and they have to sign off on it, they go, yeah, they do that. Yeah, they do that. Yeah, they do that. You do that. But, it's, but it's just a random bunch of stuff here. And again, by focusing on outputs, this, so to avoid analysis paralysis, your first question should be, what are people trying to produce? For whom? What's important about that? Focus on the output that is somebody else's input. Like my script writer, my treatment it informs the script. The script informs the video shooting uh, plan, blah, blah, blah. So look for that and then look for the tasks. And then, then you can start thinking about, well, what are the knowledge and skills required? But most people got trapped in the analysis process. I watched a lot of my peers at Motorola, especially, because we all came in and we all had experience and it was all different. And people got trapped into doing analysis that took months. I had a client group, same guy that threw the binder across the room. He said, Guy, we really hate it when people like you 
come back 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. And I realized that because because I'd asked to do analysis and this was, he'd obviously had some bad experiences with people like me who doing analysis and taking 90 days to come back and tell them what they told me. And so I said, okay, let's do it right now. So you want manufacturing supervisors what are the big chunks of their job? What I mean, what do they do? How would you describe their job? And so we created a list. And I said, in this first chunk here, what do they produce? They do stuff, but what are they trying to produce? And they started listing that stuff. And we listed tasks out. And then I said, so what are some of the typical problems? Well, and they could name some. And I said, well, some of the probable causes. And that stymied them. They were stuck. But they knew I had trapped them. They knew that that would be good information to give to the new people. I don't have the answer. I did that job 20 years ago, Guy, but I don't know what's going on today. I know what the problems are, but I don't know what the causes are. So they let me go out and do analysis. And it was a big, huge win. It was the project before that where they threw the binder across the room. <clears throat> Guy, I want to have one. I have another question for you. You're talking a lot about various skill sets, and it almost seems like we also need to be aware of what our skill sets are and uh, the skill sets of the people in our teams. When you talk about the pivot point in your process, what skill set does that require? So it requires being able to do project planning so that you can go conduct the analysis do that quickly so there's an analysis skill but then there's the reviewing with the client mm. now so when i present the data to the client you know so the the chart i showed you the performance model chart if i was running a group meeting with eight to ten twelve master performers i'd write up on a chart that looked just like that flip chart easels with all those columns and all that stuff and i would get it typed up word processed to look just like that using the words that they that I captured so that the flip chart looked just like the printed page. And that's what I would show the clients. Um, and this is what your people said. I've asked them the questions. They've, I've captured this. This is the outputs. That's how you measure one. These are the tasks. These are the problem. And they would look at that and then they would have to decide. So I was just a facilitator of walking them through, pacing them, because a lot of people like to, you know, look ahead and it was difficult to keep them all on the same page so i would you know unfortunately i would read to them <laughs> not everything on the page just the really the things that i thought would be intriguing or upsetting to them i'd say here's this output and that third measure there yeah that's the one that fails look on the other side of the page there yeah there's a gap that's the one that's missed that's the one problem either that sounds and feels true to you guys because you own these people um and and so but these are the causes here and you can see whether the, if there's no dk there then we can throw training at it learning at it but it's not going to do anything here it's the process or it's the consequence system or it's whatever i captured and then coded it so the di would have could have been you know that uh that these people don't know how to do strategic planning. They're concrete thinkers. They don't do strategic abstract kinds of future state. No, they're, and so that either resonated with them. You know, I used to tell clients that, you know, what I'm capturing here is already known. It's just never been pulled together and put on one page. And either it feels correct to you, and then you can decide what we need to do about it. But, but for new people need to fo just focus. So, one of the, I was given three things on my first day on the job. Uh, a newsletter article from 1970, Gilbert and Rumler talking about guidance, the short way home, which is all about job aids. Um, the second thing was a uh, Mager and Pipe book on analyzing performance problems, or they really ought to want to. And I spent my first night in the hotel room and read that book cover to cover. That book was so impactful to me that that's the, I've written blog posts that said the first book I would give a new staff member to read is Analyzing Performance Problems by Bob Mager, Robert F. Mager, and Peter Pipe. Um, 
it's a classic book. It's got a flow chart in it that's really simple to figure out, you know, is training got anything, is knowledge and skills got anything to do with the issue that we're looking at? And if it's not, what what are the issues that we need to be attending to versus knowledge and skills? That because my new boss said, we're going to do performance-based instruction. Um, and we're going to avoid doing instruction when it's got nothing to do with the problems that we're trying to solve for our clients. Now, if it's a new hire, people don't know anything. Yeah, you got, then you got to do the whole thing. But if the genesis for your effort isn't new hires need training, it's we've got a performance problem or we've got a performance opportunity, then we need to really diagnose what that, you know, what's the process, outputs the tasks, you know, and what are what's the what are the gap analysis or the anticipated gaps for a future state thing? So it's that relentless focus on on performance before we even get into knowledge and skill analysis. Before we get into how do we reuse existing content, it, it I think if my success is due to a large part because I really mastered that early. I learned to think about outputs before I thought about tasks, which is hard because my experience, I would tell people that I've trained in this methodology. Yeah, I want you to start in that output column and the measures, but in truth, the people that you're talking to, they don't think about outputs. They think about the things that they do. They can identify the tasks. So I go, okay, okay, forget the output column. Give me a task. Okay, what do you do before that task? What do you do before that, before that, before that? Okay, that's, the, that's where it starts. Okay, let's go back to where we started. That task. What do you do after that task? After that? Oh, and then you produce the report. Okay, so the report is the output. And everybody in the room would go, that's what you want. Okay, we get it now. And sometimes it didn't happen that quickly, but sometimes it did where people said, oh, I get it. We do things and produce things. And that's what you want over in that column. So how do you tell a good analysis report from a bad one? Well, it's, you know, quality, quantity, cost. You know, quantity is t a time measures are in the quantity thing. What's the quality? Well, it's got to have this, it's got to have that. So we can begin to articulate, you know, what, what constitutes quality? What constitutes quantity? What co constitutes the cost element of that? Um, and again, using, you know, whatever measurement metrics are standard in the company. But focused on that, that output and tasks. And I've had clients... <laughs> steering teams look at that data and then they would turn to my client the training guy and they go how come you never did this this way before this makes sense the stuff you've been doing is crap what you know and i feel bad for my client and i hope that they would you know segue into a performance orientation because i think that that's that's so critical um in truth, when you, you know, if you're new in an organization and they're going to go, we're going to generate content on topics, we're going to use AI and, and generate a whole bunch of content with AI. And we're going to package that and deploy it or something. I don't know what, and because that's all moving target changing thing. Um, you know, then maybe they're never going to get to a performance orientation. The joke in my organization for people who, couldn't adjust to our way of doing things. We'd bring in new staff members. They'd been in training before. They just couldn't get the performance orientation on. And, and our joke was, unfortunately, you're going to need to seek happiness elsewhere because you are the square peg in our round hole over here. And this is how we do things. We focus on performance. I don't want a bunch of knowledge that you went and researched and packaged it because you, one, don't know how they're to apply any of that in their work tasks. And if you can't help the learner figure out this law and regulation, this code, this tool, this data, how do I use that in my task to produce my output? Because we're too often trapped in this educational mindset where if we make people knowledgeable, well, that's good because everybody's experienced the education system. So they know what that looks like. So that's kind of what they expect from training organizations. Now we call it learning organizations thanks to Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, and everybody wanting to become a learning organization. In the 90s, my clients changed their names from training and development to learning and development because we've got to be learner-centric. I'm sorry, training was always learner-centric. It had a dual centricity, the performance and the people in that performance, because you had to attend to both in order to be successful, to produce instructional content that made an impact.
that did transfer because it was authentic, you know, unless somebody out there stopped it. And then it had an impact because you were focused on the task to produce outputs to meet stakeholder requirements. The, we've, we've mystified the whole measurement and evaluation of instruction. You know, your analysis data should tell you, well, this is what we got to measure when we're all done. These outputs and the measures that we've identified, they need to improve. What's the baseline numbers? How quickly are we doing this now? What are the costs for doing this? What are they after the instructional, the learning experience? Um, but so I, again, uh, it's 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 everybody is different, and so where you're starting from, and your performance contexts are different. You know how you do things. Either it's an artist colony where everybody does their own thing their own way. Who knows what happens? Or you're more of an engineering mindset as a learning and development function with processes that are kind of somewhat standard, you know, uh, as rigorous as required and as flexible as feasible. How do we actually produce good instruction quickly that's effective and efficient? You know, that's that's the goal, I think. And I don't think the artist colony is the way to do it, but there's a time and a place for that too. Personal view here. Controversial at times. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I can stay as long as you guys need to. Please use this opportunity to ask Guy all the questions, concerns that you may be witnessing, experiencing at your end. The other thing, while you're thinking about that, you can also email me your questions and I will send an answer back to Rhea and she can distribute to everybody so you can take advantage of the questions other people have. You know, I've, I've, I've given you a lot uh, in this uh, session and so you may need to think about it a little bit more. So there is that article, that chapter 11 from the 2006 Handbook of Human Performance Technology, 25 pages. It, it covers what we covered here today and more, more of all of the analysis, the knowledge and skill analysis and the categories of knowledge and skills that I use and how I systematically derive that. So there's more there, but but so you can, you know, you don't have to ask your questions, you know, tomorrow you can wait and hit me with questions and, you know, I'll be happy to uh, circle back and, and answer those because I think you need to think about this a little bit and, and put this in your context, in your role, in your organization and think about what fits or not. But again, focus on the outputs. That's really kind of the lesson and this was this is the lesson from the 1960s 1963 at the university of michigan uh george ordeon who came up with management by objectives he was part of this group with rumler and all the you know or what the japanese call policy deployment or hoshin planning it's all this cascading of top level goals and and cascading them through the entire organization and anchoring how do we meet that goal well we produce things to meet that goal that's the output and and looking at outputs as really inputs downstream who are the downstream customers for the things that you produce you know we produce learning for learners and then they go do work so who's the customer's customer we got learners as a customer who's their customer well their supervisors their cut you know so it's a complex thing here and just being able to do some systems thinking around performance and processes and again use the language of your organization you know go find the quality people and you know go to go to lunch dutch you know you don't have to take anybody out on a date you know but you can say let's meet at lunch here or for coffee or something like that and can you tell me answer some of my questions about how do we measure things around here you know how is score kept yes guy so there is systems thinking and then there is systems thinking. So it is complex. How does one draw boundaries around one's systems thinking? How does one know that one is, one might say that they're systems thinking, right? And they're not. 
So I have seen all of these combinations, and so some advice here. <clears throat> Uh, that's a that's a hard one. I I think that some people just naturally are kind of systems thinkers. They're always thinking about, you know, what's outside, what could go wrong, you know, um, um, not just looking at one thing, but looking at the things around it. And so you your mental model, whatever mental model you have, helps you look broader than the one area of performance. If we're a learning function in a in a company systems thinking would say, well, who are our suppliers? Who are our customers? Who are our other stakeholders? And begin to think of them from a stakeholders and what other processes intersect with our own processes. But not everybody thinks in, in terms of processes, which I think are an element of system thinking. You know, it's the intersections of various things. It's all the Venn diagram kinds of things. What are all the component piece parts? Um, when I did work with the auto companies, um, they would have the, it's just like, you know, okay, you buy a swing set and you're going to build a swing set. There's a diagram and a parts list. That's system thinking right there, right? And so those are the components of the swing set, you know? And so you begin to look at the swing set as the as the assembly assemblage of all of these piece parts. But then Swing set can be set on concrete or out in the grass or, you know, and so what's the playground? Is there another one there? How close is it to the other thing? So if you swing and fall off the swing, are you going to hit the, you know, the monkey bars? I mean, so so systems thinking is the practice, I think, that um, and I'm making this up as I go along um, of looking at all the 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 things that are nearby and then the things on the circles as as they go out. What are those things? Um, physical, tangible things, then you can think of things in the abstract in terms of the of the reasoning behind the physical and tangible things. Um, but it is tricky. And so, yeah, the whole thing with systems thinking, I don't know why, but it, it but it, but I, I think I had an easier time with it. Am I any good at that? Hell, I don't know. Um, I think it's, I think I'm capable of doing that, but I imagine there are some good models and courses i never took a course in all of that stuff but that was one of the things that rumler used to talk about he used to talk about systems thinking and i can't remember the name of the person back at the university of michigan who he credited with teaching him systems thinking but it's on one of the videos that that i have of gary rumler um it's it's those of you who you know so there's a whole bunch of videos not just mine, but but other people have videos. Carl Binder, um, it, which is somebody you should probably have in your course, and I think he's sp spoken to your class before. This is, I think, my third uh, video webinar that I've done with Boise State. But there are um, others that that you need to learn from. You know, I think that that's one of the things is that you just got to learn and then you know adapt what you're learning back into your start building your model. How do you do analysis? What do you produce? What are your tasks? You know, capture something and build out from there. What do you got to do? Before, you know, one of the things that, that why I put project planning and kickoff on the front of my Addy like process is because I saw a lot of people go launch into projects and do things and there was no plan. Mm -hmm. And if their client ever asked them, so when are you going to be done? They had no clue. They couldn't even tell the client, I can be done on this date if you give me these kinds of resources here, here, and here on these dates. Oh, you can't make that date? Okay, then everything slides and they can see it. You know, So uh, to me, I always thought that the planning was a key critical skill. But when you're brand new, you're probably working on somebody else's in somebody else's plan. But it, but then again, I've seen other people where they come in and they were responsible for the whole thing. There are no five hats to wear, five roles. They're a generalist. And so when you're a generalist, you really got to kind of master a whole bunch of things like project planning, analysis, design, development, and using all the tools and videos. And I mean, where does it end? And and maybe you have to go facilitate and you have to facilitate review meetings with clients. And so there's a whole ton of skills but you could be entering into an, a function where the roles are narrower. You're going to be a script writer. 
okay, you're going to write scripts or you're going to be the analyst or you're going to be the planner or you're going to be the facilitator. So <clears throat> there's such a wide uh, variation in how learning and development organizations are structured and populated with people, the job titles or roles that they would. And, and um, if you, if you're looking, doing job searches and all that stuff, you see all that variance that exists because there's, you know, zero consistency across the field, the profession. Um, one might think that ATD being the monster that it is compared to ISPI and some of the other groups that they might have done that, but they've not been successful in doing that. Um, we don't even have decent glossary of terms where we can agree on on terminology. And I think people, I've been on three projects in the last 40 years to create glossaries of terms for ISPI. And they either get lost or they don't get used because people look at that and go, yeah, I see where you're coming from that, but I use I use different language or I define things differently than you. And so we're just caught up with that. It makes it harder for new people coming in to climb that learning curve, to climb that performance curve um, because of all these variances in terms of how we look at the world, how we describe it to ourselves. Challenging. Think of it as an aptitude test. Are you really built for this kind of a world? You have to have a little bit of ambiguity tolerance. Mm -hmm. People who really need things to be set, unless they enter an organization where things are really kind of more engineering oriented, where they can fit in there, learn something, and then br branch out from there. But if you get thrown into the deep end of the pool and you're supposed to figure out which way to swim, you know, and avoid the crocodiles, then, you know, that's a different world. And some of us like that. And some of us hate that. Um, challenges everywhere. All right. So you can send me questions to my email address, uh, share that Rhea, at, with everybody. And uh, um, I'll be happy, but I will answer your question and copy you on the answer and copy Rhea. And she can distribute that to everybody else or, figure out how to share that because you know somebody else may have asked a question that was sub sub in your subconscious but you couldn't get it out anything else happy to chat more about anything in particular well i got one question to finish the thought guy sure uh so that pivot point have you found that more people are accepting of non-traditional training uh, interventions or do you find people are going more away from it? Or has there been no change over your career? Well, I, th I think, you know, the, the whole advent of e-learning back in the 90s, mid to late 90s, was the first major change away from, you know, everything had to be classroom. Now, I, I was back at Motorola in 81. Um, our new director had gone and visited 30 some sites and got the complaints from all the managers about what they thought about the training stuff. And their complaint was that classrooms were sometimes canceled because not enough people were in them, which made them mad because they had people they wanted to train. So what they learned to do was to book every last seat whether people needed it or not so we had classrooms full of people who were being trained for somebody else's job you know it was a mess and he came back and said you know you guys need to think there were 13 of us you guys need to start thinking about doing self-paced training versus group paced training and in between that it was coached and so i started trying to push everything i could to self-paced means which would include the e-learning nowadays uh, since the 90s. But back in the early 80s, and I would, I would, as a consultant, I would tell my clients, if you don't stop me, I'm going to make everything that possibly can into self-paced. <laughs> and and uh, oh, I'm going to reserve group-paced training for when we people really, really, really need to come together. And that's usually about interpersonal skills. And when I build that kind of training for you, 60% of it will be in practice and feedback sessions. And so you're going to have to stop me because otherwise that's what I'm going to do for you on your money. 
And they'd go, oh, why? why? And then we'd have a dialogue about that because I'd be so bold as to say, <laughs> if you don't stop me, and that, that, you know, everybody pays attention then. And then I was hit them with, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is my philosophy. And this is what you're going to get from me unless, you know, you don't like it. And a lot of them did like self-paced and all that. Unfortunately, you know, self-paced, e-learning and all that stuff can't, re you know, nowadays we can do better at this with, uh, with all the adv advances of technology, but practice with feedback. You know, yeah, I wanted 60% of the time to be in practice with feedback. I wanted to be easy peasy, then a little bit more difficult, then way difficult, then from Hades. Yeah, <laughs> hellacious. I want to do that. And clients would, you know, that wasn't part of their, their, their experience, you know, they one and done. And I would argue with them about one and done practice. Well, don't even do it. Why are we even doing this course? Guy consultants don't talk to us like that. <laughs> You're cutting off your own revenue stream. I go, I don't want to do crap work. Come on. If we're going to do something, let's make it meaningful. Let's make improvements to the performance out there. Because they'd sometimes start off with, you know, how do you address this topic? You know, they want want me to create some content on the topic, and I would I would listen to them, do my best active listening, and then I would say, so what would practice with feedback look like for that topic? And then they would go, oh well, you know, it'd be different for everybody. Oh, so we're doing one size fits nobody, or what? What are we trying to do here? And so then I would have to convince them. So who are the most critical of the target audiences and what would their practice with feedback look like? Okay, let's give everybody this content. But for those critical audiences, let's make sure that there's practice with feedback. Where's the feedback going to come from? So in e-learning, that's hard to do, not impossible uh, nowadays, but, but harder back then. But how do we make sure that we're giving good corrective and reinforcing feedback? Because guy needs to know what he's doing that's right and what he's doing that's wrong and he needs another chance now to do it right and where he would done it wrong you know and that 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 escalation of practice because one and done isn't sufficient guy these, um, these are hard things for clients to learn but uh, this is for me it is so how do you give good feedback because I see that as a challenge even today. I mean, look at, I'm, I'm going to give you a very myopic example and putting people in group projects and then you're asked to give feedback. And most of them are professionals and the quality of feedback is not there. So then I am like, how do we elevate the content, the substantive nature of feedback because I'm guessing that it's happening within organizations, this so the, feedback. The, the late Don Toasty used to talk about feedback technology. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, feedback technology is more important than instructional technology, which is, again, technology, the, the application of science mm -hmm. to feedback. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned from him was that uh, too often we give people feedback after they've done something when we really should give it to them just before they do it again. Um, because if we give that, if if guy goes and does some practice exercise and you give me feedback by the time it's my turn to practice again, the way most training is in, is constructed, um, guy will have dismissed it all. He would go, yeah, but there, but I have this reason and this and that. Mm -hmm. And by the time I go to do it again, mm -hmm. I've rejected that feedback. So the goal of of the of whoever is giving the feedback said, "Guy, you just did that. Here's what you did right. Here's what you did wrong." And you know, adjusted the guy's temperament and acceptance of feedback. You know, negative feedback. Good feedback is always you know mostly appreciated. But he said, then when guy's time to do it again. Now I got to give him that feedback all over again. Guy, remember when you did it last time, you did this well, you did that well, but this thing here you need to really work on. And here's the strategies and tactics that you need to employ this time, the change that you need to make. Um, and now let's do it again and mm. give me the feedback again. And then another round. So that's why I would tell clients, you know, we need to have more than one round of feedback. Let's get rid of some of this low hanging fruit content that you could learn Nowadays, we call it informal learning. Back in the 80s, I called it unstructured OJT. 
you're going to learn it by hook or by crook by going out there to the job and you're going to stumble around and you're going to figure out eventually. Do we need to package that when we've got some high stakes performance that we really need to prepare people for? And we're just telling them and no practice or we're telling them and then we tell a war story and get rid of the war stories. And no, we, we need to have that practice and we need to have that be the focus. That's why backward design focused on the app, what I call the APO, the application exercise and focus on that. And then do I need a demo? And then what's the minimum information I need just to focus on that so guy can do the practice with feedback session? If whether that's interpersonal skills, um, whether that's a, a, a you know mechanical skills or whatever, whether that's individual mm -hmm. performance or team performance, team performance I think is even trickier because um, no one likes to get negative. Most people don't like to get negative feedback in a group. You know, if you need to give me negative feedback, you should do that one on one, not in the group, even though we were a team. And uh, I think one of the issues with team exercises, team work, group projects, is that unless you really know who did what, you've got no business giving feedback to people about what it is. You can give the feedback to the entire team, but you can't give it to individual. So if guy's on a team and he slacked off and didn't do a darn thing and everybody else covered for him and did the project, and you, you don't know what feedback to give me unless somebody's, you know, ratted me out and told, said that, you know, guy did, didn't do anything. Mm. Um, but so the, the nature of feedback has got to be specific. And what this Don Toasty said, it's got to be specific. You cannot overload people with a bunch of feedback, give them two or three things at the most. None of these surveys from all of your peers and give you 25 different things here. And that's overwhelming. Nobody can react to that. If the goal of feedback is to improve somebody's performance, you need to give them the, you got to decide, do I give them the most important thing or the thing where they start? You know, because sometimes the most important thing is like on step seven and really they're doing things in step one and two and three. So we got to fix that first before we get to seven. But seven is where the meat is. That's the heart of the thing. That's where the big payback is. But mm -hmm. if we don't straighten guy out on the front end, then it doesn't matter what we give him in the back end because it'll be garbage in, garbage out, garbage in, garbage out. Here's step seven. And, you know, you, you can't fix it. So you got to you got to look at each situation to decide where do I start giving feedback? And that's, you know, training people on how to assess a situation to decide what are the earmarks that I'm looking for to see if I've got good, bad, or indifferent? And well, how do I give that feedback? And then where do I start with giving the feedback? That's that's tricky. Um, I learned a lot from Don Toasty, and he did have a couple articles on it, but I don't. I I learned most of that. We were on the ISPI board together, and. Mm -hmm used to go on and on about this like I go on and on about it now. But it also sounds to me that um, along with being specific, there is an implication that it's implied that it also needs to be dynamic, active, real time, right? Right then and there, you're kind of saying, right yeah. before you're doing this task, oh, this is what I mentioned on our performance appraisal review. Yeah, but it's like on both, right after or as I'm doing it, stop. You know, if you're going to teach somebody how to bunt in baseball, you can't say after the game is over, talk about how you bunted in the second inning when we're just finished the ninth inning. So, so the feedback has got to be timely, and sometimes you need to intervene in the process and the performance and intervene and stop it cold and give the feedback. Hmm. But sometimes you need to let it go all the way to the end. And then you've got to revisit, you know, what guy did wrong or right or whatever. And the whole sandwiching of feedback, you know, there's that's been kind of dismissed. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on, again, my my psychology, if you will, in terms of am I ready? Do I need do you need to couch my bad feedback with some good stuff? You need to sandwich that for Guy because he just can't handle just all negative feedback. You got to make me feel good, then give me a little bad, then make me feel good. You know, do you have to play that game? Yeah, sometimes you do, and and other times, <clears throat> Guy doesn't want any of that fluff. What he did good, he wants to know how to get better. Tell me what I did wrong, what I need to really improve. Is it my? I was doing things with uh, 
with uh, Neil Rackham, who wrote the spin and selling book when I was at Motorola, and he was meeting with my manufacturing clients again, this big, this gruff group. And they didn't like him because he was a British gentleman, kind of short, goatee, three-piece tweed suit. I mean, the whole thing, you know. And uh, they just didn't like him because he wasn't, you know, their kind of person. And I was pushing for more practice with feedback. And he said at one point, he said, can I, can I ask some questions here? He said, do you guys, do you guys play tennis or golf? They all did. He said, have you ever had a lesson? They all had. He said, did they try to change your grip? Oh, yeah. He said, oh, yeah, every one of them had to change their grip because they had they didn't have the right grip. He said, what happened to the ball when you used the new grip? Oh, it went this way and that way and this way and that way. It was terrible. He said, okay, so the job of the coach is to not reinforce the results, reinforce the behavior, the right grip, until the results become self-reinforcing. So if you use the, because everybody would use their new grip, they would have lose ball control. They'd go back to their old grip immediately because they, mm. they could have had better control with the old grip, but that was going to be limiting them. And so the job of the coach, he said, giving the feedback was you got to focus on the key grip thing. You know, there's the stance, there's this, there's that, but the grip, we're just focused on the grip, not the stance, not how your body posture is, just the grip let's get the grip down and so he was focused on that giving feedback uh and then working on the other parts of the body posture the, to get better ball control but the job of the coach is to give the feedback to reinforce the correct behavior until the results become reinforcing and then he said something and at, at later on i heard this decades uh, later when tiger woods came on the scene Somebody asked, well, why does Tiger Woods have a swing coach? I mean, the guy's making millions of dollars and he's just mm -hmm. the top of the game and blah, blah, blah in here. Why does he have a swing coach? Because we all backslide. So we're always looking for somehow changing what works to something different. We, we're not, you know, we've, we've automated the knowledge of what we need to do. We're not consciously thinking about it. And so we backslide or we change our posture or something goes wrong. We need somebody to be observing us and looking at that to give us that feedback. Well, I think that that's important in whether it's a group project or whether it's learning and, and development kind of practice with feedback is that that's key. And so part of the job of the instructional designer is to create the tool, the device that tells the observer what they're observing for. What are you looking for? So when I built training for labor relations courses and things like that, and we it's all interpersonal skills, we would track the verbal behaviors of people. How many times did you give information versus seek information versus test understanding versus summarizing versus defend versus attack? This is all behavioral elements from the spin selling model and, and their negotiations program. And it's from a book in the 70s, too, that Neil Rackham wrote um, before spin. And so we were looking at we wanted to increase we wanted to decrease giving information and we wanted to increase seeking information. So questions. And because most people get in there and they talk, they talk, they talk, they talk. They should be asking questions and eliciting from Guy, the performer. Well, what do you think you did right? So what went well for you? Well, what didn't go so well? Well, why do you think that is? Rather than them telling me this is what you did and this is what you did. So, so Guy would be more accepting of it if it came out of him rather than from the observer, the person giving feedback. So there's another way to give feedback is to elicit that feedback from the from the performer, the learner, and uh, and but you know so if you've got a bunch of facilitators, instructors delivering content, whether face to face or virtual, they don't they need to be prepared for how to do that and do that well, so that the feedback is actually meaningful and it can be done in a timely fashion through the design of our instruction. How do we make sure that the timing of the feedback happens right after Guy did it, and again before he did it and before he does it the next time? You know, so I got to make sure that the, the design facilitates that so that people can get what they need. 
because I may not like to get feedback in a group setting because my personality can't can't deal with it, but I probably do want to improve. And if you're creating psychological safety and giving feedback, then you know you've got to. to because some people want it with the whole room. They don't care because they don't really care about other people. <laughs> they care about mastering something. Other people care about how other people feel about them. Mm -hmm. And so that's tricky when you're designing something. How do you design it so that you, you, you take the worst case scenario? Some people aren't going to like it. So now I got to make it all one on one personal so that no, it's I don't out anybody in front of the whole group here and damage their ego. Right. So how how do i do that and um how do i make sure that's timely so the big challenge for us always was how many facilitators do we need in a room with 20 people being trained we sound like we need 20 facilitators so the other thing that i would do is part of the training for groups was to train them to be observers so not only would you sit in the hot seat in an exercise somebody would be sitting there as the observer and they would have the checklist and go, guy did this and he did that and he did this and he did that and he did this. Now that person needs to give guy the feedback and they internalize the critical elements that were focused on giving feedback on because they were an observer. Now they got to go to the hot seat and do the role play or whatever and use the right behaviors or whatever it is. And then we need to give you know, the, another observer, you just rotate people around. And so that, that way I could give more feedback. But the double-edged sword of that is that what if the observer did a lousy job, you know, didn't give guy the right feedback. So what I would do in that case is I would say, okay, there's four people here in this role play. One of them is an observer. Three people are in the role play. The observer gives the feedback and then everybody else gives, that's not in the hot seat, gives the the observer feedback. Well, you missed when guy did this or you did, you know, and so that was like three people then giving me feedback on what I was doing. And if they didn't agree with each other that guy did or did not do something well or correctly, then, then, you know, that, that would just make them more aware of what they've got to pay attention to. How come you thought he did that poorly when I thought he did that well, you know, and they'd have to have a dialogue about that. And I think that helped internalize what are the earmarks of good performance? What are what are the behavioral cues that we look for that say guy did that correctly? Um, anyway, so I, I think that yeah, feedback is a huge issue. Um, it's not something that can be taken lightly. It's it, the feet, the whole how the mechanics of how you do the feedback can create uh, a, a psychologically unsafe areas and so that's that's really tricky when we're doing that when we're you know because we can inadvertently mess with people uh to their detriment when we're trying to be helpful and we can be you know have the wrong thing occur